Anyway, we go back to basics. I basically not going to show any of our data here. This is a very, very introductory les lesson on the steps that arrive after you acquire your beautiful image, or not so beautiful image on the microscope. And you want to try to extract uh, some data, some numbers, some features out of, uh, out of these images in a very low throughput fashion. But I think in order to uh, try to understand how automatic procedures like those done in automatic in image analysis, such as in a high throughput uh, microscopy, I think you need to understand a little bit of what are the basics of these principles. So um, my talk is organized a little bit like that. There's going to be a first part which is going to give a little hint and little suggestions on the acquisition of microscopy images. Most of the topics have already been uh, discussed yesterday, so I don't want to repeat over and over the same, same thing. So it's just a few little highlights of things I think are important to know, important to remember when acquire uh, images with whatever kind of fluorescence microscope, ranging from wide field conventional fluorescence microscope to confocal microscopy, and to super resolution as well. Um, I want to discuss about next some, some concepts in image processing. So how can you work on these images? And first of all, what you are allowed from a moral and ethical <laughs> point of view <laughs> to do and what you are not allowed to do. I'm looking at some of you because yesterday we were practical. We had some discussions. <laughs> Um, and also a little bit on how you can do this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, next, we're going to move to uh, from image processing, so working on images, to image analysis, which is really trying to get some numbers, some quantifications out of your images. And of course, each of these topics would require one week of course. It's going to be only little hints, and especially for the last part, I decided to focus on two particular applications that I think might be interesting for you. I don't know if you agree. One of these is uh, colocalization analysis, so trying to understand does my green label stay together with my red label or not. And the other thing, which is more similar to what we do usually in, um, in our labs, in our facilities, is a little introduction to what is uh, an image in super resolution microscopy, and in particular in the class of super resolution microscopy that belong to the localization of individual molecules, individual fluorescent molecules, and so on. So, first of all, what's in an image? You have seen um, diagrams of microscopes similar to this one uh, several uh, times yesterday. Basically, in a microscope, you have a light source. Uh, the light source is uh, projected onto, onto your sample by a lens, which is the objective, or the condenser in Brightfield. And then you have another lens, so very often the same, very same lens, like in epifluorescence, that recollects the light and brings it to a detector. Okay? The detector, the most uh, cheap detector that we have in our hands is up actually our eyes. But typically, un unless you don't have photo ph photographic memory, you usually want to store this image somewhere. And that's the reason why we use digital detectors right, right now. So what does it mean that we store images using digital detectors? It means basically that the image of your sample need to be saved in a digital format. Digital format would means that the format is numbers. And these numbers are discrete. Okay, you don't have a continuum anymore on any parameter that relates to the image. With any parameter, I mean the position. So the sampling of your image is going to be digital. You have a, your sample. Of course, it's continuous at least up to atomic uh, level. Uh, but your image is not continuous. You're going to collect image in it. I, well-defined spots that define the pixel. I will go back to the concept of, uh, of uh, the pixel. And not only the um, position 
is discrete, discretized, is digital, but also the intensity of uh, your signal is digitized. In reality, you have any concentration of fluorescent molecules ranging in your sample, ranging from zero possibly to the maximum concentration that you have. But actually, you have to convert this in a number, and your number is going to be discrete. It's going to be capable of having values only between one minimum value and one maximum value in integers, typically. Okay? From zero to 255 you collect images with a bit depth of 8 bits. Of course, if you collect a time series, your time sampling will be discrete. You collect images a separate time. If you collect different spectral properties, different colors, let's say, with different dyes, your uh, wavelength discrimination will be discrete. Your Z, if you collect Z stacks, will be discrete, and so on. So basically, an image in modern uh, microscopy, at least, it's a matrix of numbers. Okay, we have a, a matrix like this, so many little boxes. In each box, you put a number, which is the intensity uh, of the area of space in the real sample that maps to that particular uh, that particular pixel. And the size of the area that's mapped into that particular pixel is the size of the pixel that you typically express in microns. And we will do during the practical a small exercise to try to understand how can we compute this uh, pixel size given the parameters of your instrument, like the magnification of your objective. Typically, inside that one particular pixel, you have a number. And this number should be, in theory, proportional to the concentration of uh, fluorescent molecules or concentration or fluorescence intensity of, of your sample, okay? which is very nice because it makes microscopy a quantitative technique. It allows you to measure inten intensities that are, or numbers that are, in theory at least, proportional to the concentration of your molecules. Be careful, though, that this is true as long as your pixel size is much larger, larger in the image, in, in, in the sample, let's say, much larger than the resolution of your microscope. What is the resolution? Uh, we discussed with those who have already done the practical in image processing we discussed yesterday. With the others, you had uh, several the definitions and discussion about the resolution yesterday. Basically, the resolution is the fact that if you try to image a very small object with uh, a microscope, with a lens in general, with uh, whatever optical apparatus, the image of this very small object, let's think, let's think about it as a single fluorophore. And let's imagine, for example, that this is a GFP. And let's imagine that this is two nanometers in size. And we try to image a single GFP. It's image just because of the, we, try, we are trying to focus light just because of diffraction will be something like that. 200 nanometers in size, approximately. Okay? At least if you use visible wavelengths. Okay? So the, the resolution limit is due to the fact that we cannot bend the light as tightly as we would like. This is the principle of diffraction. It's the same principle for which, if you look at, uh, in a sunny day, at the shadow made by a wall, you don't have a straight line, but you have also a cone of gray light. I should have it here. I don't have it. It doesn't matter. It's a physical principle that seems to be uh, unbreakable. Okay? And the cause is that any time we try to image something small with um, a set of uh, any optical app app apparatus, really, what we get is not an image that's uh, very truthful to the small object that we're trying to image, but rather it has some pattern, some distortion, which is the diffraction of the spot or the point spread function, in the, in the case of microscopy, of, of your system. What does this have to do with resolution? It has to do with resolution because now we can imagine to try to image two small objects, one close to each other. We can still image them, for sure, but if they are, they are too close, and if we, they are below this resolution limit, we cannot distinguish 
them anymore. We cannot resolve them anymore. We cannot anymore say, are these really two objects, or is it just one? At least uh, from the point of view of the image, or the shape, the pattern produced by, to, to this, by, to this, uh, by these two uh, point, point sources. Of course, this is also you already saw, there uh, uh, has been intense work by Abbe and others in the 19th century to try to define the laws of, uh, uh, that define the maximum resolution of an optical apparatus such as a microscope, and you know that the resolution limit will depend on the wavelength, so with UV light, typically we'll have better resolution than with infrared, and depends on optical properties of, uh, um, of your system, which is the numerical aperture of the objective in this particular case. Uh, this is nice because we have a number, the, the, the denominator of this uh, relationship, so one can think that one can make the numerical aperture arbitrarily large, but there's a limit to this number, which is defined by the refractive index and by the angle that can be taken under, under, under the lens. So, Practically, it's very difficult to go beyond 1.6, numerical aperture of 1.6. This basically means that the maximal resolution is roughly, uh, that can be obtained is roughly half of the uh, wavelength of the light that you use to probe your, your sun. Okay. You heard too many times about resolution, so I'm gonna stop with that. The only, the only thing, that I want to reiterate is if you have a very simple sample, such as a single dot, its image is something, something like that. When you try to digitize this uh, image using a detector that has, has a smaller pixel size than uh, the point spread function of your microscope, one single point, one single molecule that fluorescents by one single molecule is going to be spread over multiple pixels. So one very practical conclusion is that uh, making the, your pixel arbitrary small doesn't improve the resolution of your microscope, okay? Because at some point you have this physical limit that's called that's gonna overcome, and there is also a very clear criteria on how to choose the optimal uh, pixel size. For example, for your images, if you're doing confocal microscopy, you can tune your pixel size pixel size practically arbitrarily, which is given by the uh, Nyquist uh, criteria, the Nyquist theorem, basically choose a pixel size that's slightly smaller than half of the resolution of your system. In this case, you know that you're gonna be sampling your sample in the right way, in the most optimal way. Uh, of course, uh, as we said before, the resolution of your microscope will depend on the numerical aperture of, uh, of, uh, of your objective. And you can get now numerical apertures typically of 1.4, 1.45 for oil immersion objectives. And if you use special uh, objectives with special immersion, you can go potentially up to 1.6 or, or so, which basically means resolutions down to 150, maybe, nanometers. Okay, so what does it mean, really? You, we usually, most of you probably are not looking a single, very small object through your microscope, when you're looking at very complex objects, like a cell, extremely complex. And uh, what does it mean, the fact that you have this distortion for every single detail of your sample you're trying to, to image? It basically means that uh, the microscope behave like a brush, okay? So let, imagine that your sample is something like that, rather a typical cell, I would say, and for every individual fluorescent molecule in your sample, the, your sample is gonna add something like this to your, to your image. The microscope is gonna add something like this to your image. This basically means that it would be like drawing again your sample using a brush that has this shape generating this image, okay? There's a mathematical term for this 
painting by brushing, okay, for taking into account the fact that you're painting or imaging one sample with one particular brush, which is convolution. Okay, you're basically convolving the linear response of your Microsoft, which is the PSF, for the object. It's really, this is the symbol that most typically, typically used for convolution. And basically, this is the operation that defines the fact that your micro microscope is blurring the details in your image. It's mathematical op operator for painting, if you want. So. Okay, microscopes are made to collect three-dimensional information about your sample. You heard about confocal microscopy yesterday, which is the main microscope that used for, uh, most widely microscope used for collecting three-dimensional information uh, from uh, your sample. What does it change from an uh, image acquisition point of view? Not much. You move from a pixel to a voxel. Uh, so a three-dimensional unit of space. And basically, the size of your voxel along the uh, third axis, the optical axis, is defined by how many, how spaced are the images that you collect at different focal planes. The um, operation of brushing, uh, of paint painting made by, by, by the microscope, this um, convolution brought by the diffraction limit applies exactly in the same way as in 2D, only that we have to think that when you're in focus, the response of the microscope, so an individual molecule in focus will appear as a relatively limited spot, okay, 200 nanometers in size, but when you move out of focus, the, especially in wide field microscopy, the response of the microscope will be more, even more blurred. And this is the reason why if you do a three-dimensional acquisition with a regular fluorescent microscope, you get a lot of out-of-focus blur from out-of-focus planes, because all the contribution from out-of-focus planes will contribute with uh, images that are, or details that are very blurred. So basically, your sample looks like this, but if your sample is a thick sample, and you collect an image with a regular wide field microscope, you get an image like this because all the contribution from out of focus plane will make the image more, more fuzzy. Okay. Not only, as I was saying, position in space is digitized in the pixel, but also intensities. So one other concept that we have to introduce is the bit depth, which is uh, uh, the number of gray values, of values, in which we decide to divide our intensity in our, in our image. Again, your sample has a continuum of intensities, so you generate an image that instead it's um, uh, digitized, a certain number of gray values, which are digital, and you can choose how many values of gray you want to have. This is usually the number of bits with which you acquire your image, usually 8 bits, 16 bits, and so on. So uh, here there are two examples. One is an extremist example in which we use only one bit to collect one image. So it means that only we collect black or white. Okay? So intensities below a certain value will be all black. Intensities above a certain value will be all white. And we get an image like this, which is not very a very good idea to acquire. I mean, it's very useful to process images to get binary images, but it's not a very good, good idea to acquire an, an image that's binary because you basically have very little information in that. And on the typical other extreme of uh, level of uh, big depth that are used uh, in the acquisition of uh, microscopy images, usually there is 16 bits, which means that we are collecting two to the 16 values of, uh, of gray. And so you have a rather good number of different gray val values, actually more than the number of gray values that your eye can, uh, can recognize in monochromatic images. So you shouldn't see a difference between what you see in the oculars <coughs> and what you see in the screen after the image has been digi digitized. 
So we have a choice, so the question is always, how do I choose if I acquire an image in 8 bits, 16 bits, 12 bits, and so on? The main important concept here is the dynamic range of uh, uh, your, your mm, microscope, basically, and the combination of your sample and your, and your microscope. Basically, what you would like to do is to have, so a digital sensor collects a certain number of values that correspond to a certain scale of intensities. All intensities below the minimum that can be recorded from your digital sensors will be put to zero. All the intensities will be higher than maximum will be put to the maximum. Okay? It's a digital means that has some boundaries. Okay? You need to have some boundaries. So, of course, you don't want to have pixels that are below the minimum and above the maximum, right? because if you want to under or oversaturate your sensor, because there you cannot extract any information from your image. But on the other side, you want to try to use as much as possible of your dynamic, dynamic range. So basically, the dynamic range is defined by the number of maximum photons, basically, that can be collected by your sample, by your sensor before getting to saturation, divided the number of photons that correspond to the noise in, in your image. This uh, dynamic range is what's going to define if you're going to use an 8-bit 8 8 -bit images or 16-bit images. Because if you have very high dynamic range and very low noise, it's important to have 65,000 shades of gray, right? Because then you can discriminate that because the noise will not affect uh, one or the other. However, if you have very low signal-to-noise ratio, like in this case, it doesn't make any sense to collect 16-bit images, so 65,000 of uh, shades of gray, because of most, most of these shades of gray will be occupied basically by noise. You will have very big fluctuations that are higher than the sensitivity in terms of intensity, which is this gray, uh, uh, this orange bar uh, in, uh, from, from your microscope. So if you have noisy images, it's a bit counterintuitive, but if you have noisy images, you can go very well with 8-bit. You don't really need 16-bit. If you have clean, nice images, then maybe 16-bit maybe is good. Depends also on, on what you're interested in, of course. OK. As I said, time is also <coughs> quantized. We have to take care about two things that happen with time in, when you collect images. Collecting images usually take time. You need to expose your sample for a certain amount of time. And if you're looking at live images, the live samples, which is basically one of the only useful applications for, for doing time lapses, because in fact, doing time lapses of fixed samples is not very informative, typically. Uh, you have to take care that your sample will not move during, during the exposure, because otherwise you will have motion blur. This is a very difficult uh, um, artifact to, to correct, because you need to know some a priori knowledge about the movement of your sample, which you don't always know. So my, my, my suggestion, is that to try to keep it at minimum. So for live imaging, try to keep your exposure time as short as possible, compatible to the dynamics and the kinetics of, of your sample. Ideally, you want to avoid that your sample mo moves more than one PSF, 200 nanometers from one frame to the next. The other thing that happens, and it's already been um, discussed yesterday, is that during, during imaging in time, uh, if you're looking at fluorescent molecules, you have photoblitzing. Mm -hmm. So the irreversible, irre, irre, irreversible loss of fluorescence due to many kinds of molecular interactions between the um, fluorophore in the excited state and other mm, molecular players in your sample, mostly molecular, molecular oxygen. Uh, photobleaching has the clear effect of make, making your signal decrease over time as you collect more and more images. The point is that from an image processing point of view, photo bleaching can be corrected, potentially. Uh, however, together with the, uh, so, so you can renormalize the fluorescent intensity over time. However, you have to keep in mind that as your intensity decreases, your signal to noise ratio is gonna decrease, and this cannot be restored. I mean, you're gonna lose quality in your image in the sense that you're gonna lose. Uh, signal and the noise is going to be still the same, so it doesn't, your signal to noise uh, ratio is degraded. Again, the Nyquist criteria applies also to time, so if you want to sample 
one event at a certain frequency, characteristic frequency, it's good to sample twice as fast as the frequency of, of, of the event. Okay, I talk too much. Uh, okay, let's go into uh, image processing. And let's see what you can do and what you cannot do with your image. You collect your image, it's a nice image, hopefully, maybe it's not so nice image, so you want to apply some filters to improve your image, or you want to highlight something and so on. And let's see what, 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 what we can do. I mean, there are several guidelines published. One of these is this relatively old guideline in JCB. Uh, there are some even, uh, even more recent, but they're all pretty. Uh, there, there is a consensus on the things that can be done with a microscopy image and things that cannot be done. What can be done? You can for sure adjust the brightness and the contrast of your image, provided that if you are showing two images together in your paper, panel A1 and A2, you apply the same correction to both of them. Okay. You can do cropping. In the sense that uh, if you realize that you collected an image that's too big, I mean, it's confusing because you have too many cells, um, you can crop a smaller region. O of course, every, anything you do, keep the originals because they might be, might be asked. You can do uh, what we will see in a few, in few slides, which is the removal of uh, some noise by image processing. You can do linear transformations. You will be clear what linear transformations are in a few slides. The important thing is that you state that you have done this processing, and again, keep the original. You can, you can use more, uh, let's say, uh, creative ways of displaying colors in uh, your image, like using false colors maps, using mm, non-linear mapping, which is gamma, and, uh, and so on. So, you can decide, I don't know, to show all the low intensity pixels in red and high de intensity pixels in, in green or vice versa. This is something that, uh, that you can do. Of course, you need to state it and you need to show a reference, which is the color map that you have used to generate the, the image that you used. Of course, always keep the original. This side is more interesting. This is what you cannot do. And it's only partial, unfortunately, but... Uh, We'll try to, <laughs> if you have questions, just ask, of course, and uh, I, I can try to tell you if it sounds reasonable or not what you're trying to do. You can, cropping it can be done, but it cannot be done if you're intentionally masking something that you, want, you don't want to show that doesn't fit with your hypothesis and so on. Okay, this is called data manipulation, and I shouldn't tell you, you, sh you, sh you, sh you shouldn't say that. Somebody yesterday night at dinner used data massaging, and I think that's... Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, you cannot, of course, cut one cell from one side and one cell from another image and put, uh, put them together with, uh, with paint. In general, you cannot use paint. Don't use <laughs> Photoshop, please. <laughs> Photoshop is not a software for scientific image processing. Okay? There are better softwares. Some of them are open source. And you can keep a better track of what you can do and what you've done. Also. The problem with Photoshop, the main problem with Photoshop is not that it's illegal to use it, but it's that, it's that sometimes it's very hard to understand what is the software doing, it's a proprietary software, you don't have access. And so you see also even difficult for the scientists to say, to understand if they're doing something that is legit or, or not. You cannot use cloning tools uh, or selective deletion of image features, like in this case. The other thing is that it's very easy to spot this manipulation of images by an expert eye. I mean, if you look at this set, uh, image as it has been presented in one paper, it looks totally, totally fine, right? But then you blow the contrast, ah, and black stuff up here? What was there? No? And it, I mean, this is an example from literature. It's not good, <laughs> okay? So, um, let's, let, let's go into a little bit the things. I, I won't discuss more of the things that you can do, okay? Let's discuss a little bit the things that you can do. And one of the first things that were listed is the adjustment of, uh, of the contrast. So, the adjustment of the contrast can be done very easily 
in any, any software, you can always plot this thing, which is the histogram of uh, the fluorescence intensity in your image. So how frequent is one particular pixel intensity in your image. And you can adjust this to make maybe an image that's a little bit uh, noisy with a lot of background a little nicer. But you cannot be extreme, right? If you do adjust the contrast and this uh, uh, adjustment of the contrast starts to high features, then it's not good anymore. Uh, for example, you cannot get to oversaturation, so make pixels so bright that are at the um, limit of your, your mm -hmm. uh, grayscale uh, uh, levels. Yeah, right? You see this big peak at 155, this is an 8-bit image, that's too much. You cannot do the opposite. Like, in this image, one would say, ah, oh, yeah, I see only the spots and I don't see the nucleoplasm. But this is just because I adjusted the scale so that the intensity of the nucleoplasm was, was basically undetectable. And in fact, they have a lot of undersaturation uh, pixels. This is not what you can do to present, at least, some, some images. In general, these kind of transformations are called uh, pixel-based uh, transformation. Uh, or intensity transformations are a transformation in which one, the value one of one pixel in the output image is determined by one particular mathematical operation that you do on the same pixel. So you have a formula like this, you have out that's in multiplied by a certain function of in pixel by pixel. These kind of transformations are the one I show you, the adjustment of brightness and contrast, Intensity inversion, sometimes you want to make black what's white and white what's black, that's totally fine. <coughs> Thresholding, which basically means transforming uh, X-bit <coughs> images in two-bit images where you only have objects and backgrounds, like this. And also more mm, uh, non-linear somehow, or at least uh, 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 still pixel-based but non-linear uh, transformations, more creative transformations, such as gamma and so on which basically uh, are allowed, but you need to state what, what you're doing. You are basically do a mapping like this to the intensity. From this, you enhance a lot bright pixels and much less dim, dim, dim pixels. OK. I think I was going to skip a few slides, potentially. But uh, you have another set of transformations that are very useful to try to remove noise from noisy images, which are uh, local filters, uh, so are basically filters that uh, um, I don't know why I've lost one slide. Okay, that doesn't matter. Are basically filters in which the value of one pixel in the output is determined by the value of that pixel and pixels on the neighbor. Okay, so it basically means doing a, a sort of convolution exactly like a microscope, but at the post-processing level. And for example, you can blur your image by saying, OK, for each pixel, calculate uh, the average of that pixel plus uh, a corona of pixels are around it. And this, of course, will generate a blurred image, because you can average that pixel with all the ones that, uh, that are around. This is going to deteriorate the resolution of your, of your image, of course. But on the other side, uh, it's going to remove some, uh, some noise, uh, because very small details will, will, be blurred, will be blurred out. And you have many of these kind of filters. You have also nonlinear filters, where the operation is uh, nonlinear. The simplest one is a median filter, which is the same of the mean filter. So for each pixel, you calculate. Uh, you take in account pixels around that. And you calculate the median of this big, uh, this big square. <coughs> this is a filter that's useful for removing outliers. Like the median always removes, removes out, outliers. So for example, if you have uh, what's called uh, salt and pepper noise, which is the kind of noise that you get when you use a high gain on your, on your uh, detector, you basically uh, have images like this with isolated pixels with very high values if you apply a median filter you get, uh, this, this noise goes, goes away. It doesn't kind of preserve better the resolution of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of your image than the, the, the mean filter. 
Be careful, this is a nonlinear filter, which means that the order in which you apply this filter and others might affect the final outcome of, of, of your image. So, so the, the, result, the final result image, when you apply more than one filter, if you use nonlinear filters, depends on the order in which they, you apply them. So. And with this kind of local filters, you can do many other things that are a little more complex, like, for example, the detection of edges in your image, for example, if you want to find the boundary of your nucleus, you can ap apply um, uh, kernels, so you can apply filters that basically calculate locally the, the derivative of the image, and this allows you to uh, uh, identify where the maximum change in the image intensity is, in which pixel you have a maximum change of, it, of, uh, of intensity which corresponds to the edges between objects. Uh, and background. I can do a lot of, a lot of things. This, I think, uh, I'm going to skip because, because we're going to see it in, uh, in the practicals, how to segment images, so how to extract uh, objects and features from, uh, from uh, your image. Basically, you need to uh, obtain binary images from your starting image and try to uh, understand uh, where your objects are, and then you can measure a lot of properties, like how big they are, what is their perimeter, do they look like circles or not, uh, what is the intensity, you can use them as maps for, for other channel images and so on. So, but we see all of this in the practicals, really. Do, do, do. A very important thing is that uh, there are, as I was telling you before, open source, free softwares that allow you to perform some sort of image processing and image analysis. The most famous one, I guess, is ImageA or Fiji, the two flavors of, uh, of uh, ImageA. There are also tools that allow you to automate the image processing and bring it to relatively medium to large scale uh, analysis. These are also open source and, and free. For example, Cell, Cell Profiler is one of the most famous. Last week came out the new version of Cell Profiler. Before it was a tool limited to two-dimensional two images. Now it has been extended to the analysis and the automated and high-throughput analysis of three-dimensional three -dimensional stacks as well. The nice thing is that it does not require any prior knowledge in programming, so if you, even if you don't have a background in uh, informatics or you don't remember anymore how to program, it doesn't matter. It's, just, it's very intuitive. Okay, segmentation, so identification of, of, of objects, of course, is important for a several number of things. One of these things is tracking of cells in live cells, to try to follow one cell in time. And in this field, enormous progress has been done right now. You can basically track each individual cell in an embryo during development up to relatively late uh, stages of divisions and the amount of data information that you get from this kind of movies, you can imagine it's enormous. On the other scale, which is actually the scale that I'm working on, uh, we have algorithms for tracking individual molecules in living cells and to follow them in time. They're much simpler than these ones, because at least individual molecules don't divide. Uh, but uh, these are the two steps. Right? You can track every cell in one on, on, on organism, or you can try, track, try to track basically every molecule in uh, one, one, one cell. So, since the microscope is making images blurred by um, this convolution mathematical uh, process or operation, if you say, it's worth less can use a mathematical operation to try to revert this process. So, try to get rid of the blurring caused by the brushing of the of the microscope. This is what is called deconvolution. What does deconvolution mean? It means that we have an image here, which is given by the uh, convolution of your object, your sample, and the PSF of the microscope. You try to invert this thing to get uh, from the image the object. Okay? Of course, what, what it would lead is to 
higher quality potentially higher resolution with optical session capability images potentially so deconvolution is in the field by from more than 20 20 years much more than that actually 20 25 maybe and uh, as advantages no because if you can use this mathematical operation to uh, improve spatial resolution, remove out of focus blur, and improve the contrast of the image, you get a much better image at the end than, than at the beginning. It's possible to do this mathematical operation of inverting. Uh, the mathematics would be a little boring because it goes through uh, Fourier theorem, and, and the po main point is that this is not a normal multiplication, right? Because it's basically a multiplication norm point by point, there's a mathematical operation that allows you to transform this in normal multiplication, which is, a, in fact, the Fourier transform, and once you have a normal multiplication, you can say, okay, uh, you know, if this is a normal multiplication, I bring O on the other side, and I on the other side, and I, and I, I get it. The problem is at this point, you have, um, you have what? <laughs> you have I at the bottom, you have noise, so you have values of pixel potentially zero, you divide by zero, this is not very nice, so it's more complex than that, right? And smart people that over the years developed many, many ways of doing deconvolution. You don't really know to know, you don't really need to know um, uh, details. Most of the algorithms for deconvolution require you to know what is the response of your microscope, so what is the PSF of your microscope. You can get that experimentally, basically, by imaging very small objects, very small bits, for example, and then plug, it, plug them in. Uh, there are also some algorithms that are, alg are algorithms for blind deconvolution that do not require mm -hmm. do not require knowing what is the response of your microscope a priori. So, as for every uh, non-exact mathematical approach, because these are non-exact mathematical approaches, uh, you have some problems potentially with each of these techniques, the problem, the original problem of deconvolution was speed. I mean, it could take up to one night to deconvolve um, one three-dimensional stack of many, many images. Now, this is not anymore really, really a problem. You actually have plugins in ImageA that allow you to do deconvolution on a regular computer in relatively efficient, uh, <coughs> relatively efficient times. You have Problems that are related to the fact that when you do deconvolution, the convolution algorithms have difficulties in handling noise. So you have, if you have noise, it's easy to get amplification of this noise after after deconvolution. And you also have, might have some artifacts in the, your image, for example, in a long continuous structure such as cell membranes. Very often you can see ringing. So, like in the deconvolved image, it appears like there's a second faint band. Uh, very close to the first uh, man, man man so you have to be careful a little bit on what it's doing. And there are also, <coughs> there are also uh, approaches that allow to take out these artifacts so that are anti-ringing anti steps. The advantage though it's great, I think. You can move from three-dimensional stacks like this, very blurred, to very clear very clear Im images. We, we, these are all images collected with a regular wide field uh, microscope or from this to that. There are some practical uh, things that you need to keep in mind when you do the convolution. First of all, try to acquire images at your best, which basically means take into account the, the Nyquist criteria about the resolution. So you use pixel size that are half or less than half uh, the resolution of, uh, of uh, your microscope. Avoid to be un have signal that our pixels are either over or under saturated because are, these are clearly not managed well by uh, the convolution algorithm. It's always a good idea if you col collect this stack to uh, acquire always a portion of your stack where there's nothing, both above and below, below your sample. So this is also allowed to uh, get a better uh, deconvolved image. Of course, always double check, try to look for art artifacts and you can try different different um, methods or different settings of the methods because there's a number of parameters that need to be set for every, whenever you deconvolution. 
is uh, performed. Once you found your settings for one particular cell, if you want to process multiple images, then you process all that, the multiple images with the same settings, of course. I have five minutes, no, three minutes, no, eight minutes. And in eight minutes, we speak about colocalization. If you are interested, are you interested? It's okay. So, what is colocalization? Colocalization is collecting images with two labels, two dice, and try to understand if the <coughs> two dice are in the same place. Okay? If two dice are in the same place, it might mean many different things. Most colocalization, uh, or the most widely used colocalization methods are pixel based, which means asking are the two dice in the same pixel, associated pixel by, by pixel. This means that might mean many different things from a biological perspective or from a physical point of view. Uh, it might mean that uh, the two dice are together because they are in the same compartment. Maybe that they are both in the same pixel because they are interacting. And you cannot really distinguish between this. So it's, it's actually, a no colocalization is not a good measure of any of this. The ideal setting of colocalization is the fact, a typical at least, say, um, application of colocalization is that you have two, a novel interaction between protein A and protein B, you have done the co-IP and they come together and you also want to see an image. At that point, the simplest thing that you want to show in your paper is an analysis of colocalization of the two signals. Of course, since we are speaking about microscopy images, Colocalization depends, uh, <coughs> and the resolution of colocalization depends on the res resolution of your microscope. So if you would have a microscope with a one nanometer resolution, you could probe uh, colocalization with one nanometer resolution. Right now we are limited uh, with a regular microscope by 200, 200 nanometers. The problem is that, uh, and that every biologist face when doing, uh, everybody actually, not only every biologist face when uh, approaching the colocalization area, field, is that uh, there are many different methods to uh, analyze colocalization, and typically, at least I was a little bit confused to understand what, what, what's going on when I first approached this. First thing in colocalization is do not trust your eyes. Okay? If you look at this image, which clearly is not a biological image, you might be tempted to say, Okay, there's some green details, some red details, and then some yellow. Yellow means colocalization, right? Means that the red and green are together. However, if you look close up, it's not true. I mean, this is as red, as, as green as this detail. So there's no yellow in this image, but your eyes are uh, broad to think that you have colocalization signal, or you have yellow signal, even if there's no yellow in this image. A good thing to avoid the misinterpretation of uh, your images is try to move from this kind of image, okay, which is a two-color image, the one you would collect with your microscope, to this kind of representation, which is a, <coughs> basically a two-dimensional histogram of, uh, of intensity histogram of your image. It's very similar. How many of you do fax? Yeah. How many do you, of you know what fax is? Okay, yeah. You know. You, you, you have clear what is the output of the typical parts. You have uh, this kind of graph in which you have one axis, another axis, and dots. And then every dot represents a cell, okay? And tells you how much of one and the other antibody is it cell by cell. This is the same thing pixel by pixel in the image. This tells you pixel by pixel, I mean, how many pixels have a certain green intensity and a certain red intensity, okay? The color represents how many pixels you have, you have found. So, this is, I mean, this example is not very good because this is, I think, mitochondria and lysosomes that do not colocalize, and we'll get into that in one moment, but how does it look like for something that's really uh, colocalized? So let's imagine to have an object that's both green and red, let's measure colocalization, and let's do this two-dimensional uh, intensity histogram or, or scatter plot, if you want. Uh, what's gonna happen that the pixels have high red, have also high, high green, and so in your scatter plot, you will get a diagonal, which should be an index of high colocalization. Okay? Let's consider instead the case in which you have this situation, in which you have red 
one red object and one green object with complete non colocalization what you would get is that the pixels that are high red have low green, and the pixels that are high green have low red. So it should be anti-correlated, uh, uncorrelated actually, and what you get is something like that. There are pixels with different reds up to high red with no green, and pixels with high green with no, no, no red. Okay? So it's very, a very pictorial and graphical way of showing, showing colocalization. Of course, you can do some calculations, because as we already used in our words, this kind of a plot gives idea that the red intensities and green intensities are correlated, while this kind of plot seem to indicate that, in this case, they are uncorrelated. So why don't we calculate the correlation between the green intensity and the red intensity on a pixel-based level? And this is what the dot is done by Pearson, correlation coefficient, which is this horrible <coughs> formula, but it's very simple actually. You measure the deviation with respect of the mean of the red and the green signal, and you divide it by the, uh, by the variances of the, two, of the two signals. It's what is used in any kind of correlation of studies. Pearson, it's a linear correlation. And uh, if you calculate this, you get high value for correlated data and low value for non-correlated data, this PCC varies from 0 to 1. 1 is for perfectly correlated images, 0 for uncorrelated random uh, images, and minus 1 for perfectly uncorrelated images, which means every time you have high of one, you have low of, of, uh, of the other. And we can see the same thing with uh, biological samples, for example. If we label mitochondria with two different labels, you get diagonal line, so it would be a positive control. If you, for example, look at the correlation between a nucleus and a mitochondria, they, they should not be in the same place, and in fact, you get this kind of plot. And negative, negative correlation. It's very nice, but I have to stop. Uh, just one, 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 one more thing. When you do this kind of analysis, it's very important that uh, you select your objects, because if you do this random correlation on the whole image and you have a lot of black um, areas, what happens is that those pixels will be low, both in green and red, and so we'll add artificial correlation to your, to your data. Okay? This is the case, again, of before, where we have an uncorrelated sample because in one color we have lysosome, in the other color we have mitochondria, so they shouldn't be in the same place. But if, you, if I calculate the correlation in all the image, I get a relatively high uh, Pearson correlation coefficient value, which gets much lower when I uh, look at a region of interest that contain only, on, contains only the cell, which is what I would expect. So be, be very careful. If you're in more interested, I really have to finish. And I, I don't need 40 slides more, so this is fine. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we discuss the person by person. If you want, doesn't matter if you have questions, I'm very happy to take them. And thank you. <laughs>